Um, so today what I'm going to talk about is, uh, uh, like Attila said at, uh, while I was at the uh, Institut Fritique at uh, the Université de Sherbrooke in, in Quebec in Canada, um, I picked up a, a lot of quantum computing and I was able to interface that with a lot of um, what I learned in my, my PhD and before and after. Um, and uh, uh, I had a, a really great mentor and he sort of turned me on to these methods and, and, and I, I think I've sort of gotten onto something that I'm very excited about, which is using Langtrust recursion methods and um, being able to generate Green's function wave function. So these are the main topics that I'm gonna talk about today, but if you have any questions at any time, I'm, I'm happy to deviate and uh, try and explain a little bit better what's going on. Um, uh, yeah, no problem. So uh, the, oops. So the, what we're going to talk about today is um, quantum computing and sort of how do you even make a wave function on a quantum computer. Uh, and then what I'll talk about is some relevant quantities in quantum chemistry that you might want to calculate um, because there are some fundamental limitations. And if you find the most efficient representation of the problem, then uh, you can cut down on the amount of time that you'll actually need to use the quantum computer and be able to use it for more systems. So the, the two that I'm going to talk about today are uh, density functional theory and Green's functions. Um, and then I'll talk about something that I'm really excited about, which are Langshaw-based methods on the quantum computer um, for both the ground and the excited states. So um, where I'm going to start is with uh, quantum algorithms. And I'm going to try and give maybe a, a very broad background, because I think the field's kind of new for quantum chemistry. And, and even if you've heard this before, I hope, hopefully this will sort of motivate why I'm making some of the choices that I'm making. Um, so uh, there's this um, very well-known Copenhagen interpretation of, of quantum physics, which basically says, uh, don't, don't think about it too much, just try and use it because it's very accurate. And uh, so since, since we know that our expressions are particularly good, we just apply them in a lot of cases uh, and try not to think about sort of um, you know, wave particle duality or something like this. And we, we leave that to science fiction. Um, but so, uh, you know, in some cases, quantum physics will produce the answer out to 20 digits or more. And, uh, you know, this is quite impressive for a theory, uh, really, in any, any of the sciences. So at this point, for regular ground state, non-relativistic quantum physics, you know, where you're not colliding particles against each other, we almost trust the theory more than we do the experiment. So, you know, if, if, uh, if something is wrong, um, uh, if there's some discrepancy between the theory and the experiment, then we tend to look for maybe a new term, but we don't sort of rewrite the fundamental equations or we don't go back and, and try and make things nonlinear. Um, so I'm going to sort of play this story in reverse a little bit. Since we trust the equations of quantum physics so much, um, what I'm going to contend is, is that any operation or any, any expression that I write down on the page that obeys von Neumann's axioms uh, is going to be a valid quantum mechanics operation. And I'm not going to think about how to experimentally implement it. But I'm just going to say that if I can write it down on a piece of paper, there's some way to do it experimentally that, that will make this work. So, so we can just sort of keep it at the level of, of regular quantum physics and talk about how to do things on the quantum computer. Now, there are some limitations for the quantum computer. So I think oftentimes, um, you know, at this point in the talk, um, there are these sort of very lofty quotes by by uh, Feynman, who was the, the popular inventor of the field, even though there were other people that um, made some contributions. And, uh, um, I, but I think it's more useful to discuss quantum computers in terms of the limitations that they have. So for example, um, all of the operators that you need to apply are unitary. And sort of as a consequence of that, there's no ability to clone the wave function. So on the classical computer, what we can do is we can take all the zeros and ones that represent the wave function, and then we can copy them into a new place uh, in, the, in the computer. Or we can take one of the coefficients and we can copy it onto a new place on the computer. Uh, there's no copying in, in, in quantum computing. So there's, this is already a very, very fundamental, very basic limitation uh, that exists there. And uh, we're, we're going to have to sort of work around that. Um, the other thing that I, I'm choosing to list on this slide in terms of, a, um, in terms of a, something that uh, is a fundamental limitation is, is that um, the nature of measurement is destructive. So if I measure the wave function after performing some operations, I completely lose access to it. There's, there's not no way to recover it. There, there's some tricks that I'll show you later in the, in the slides that you can use to get around this. Um, but uh, just a, you know, a pure measurement 
of the wave function it means that you put in a lot of work into preparing the wave function, you put in a lot of work into performing some operations on it, and then you basically use it once, and then you have to repeat that in order to get enough statistics um, on, on the measurement in order to get the answer. So these, these are going to serve as some uh, fundamental you know, barriers that, that we're going to need to work within in order to make efficient quantum algorithms. Um, now, uh, having sort of discussed the, the, the drawbacks of using a quantum computer, let's talk about why, um, you know, why we think that quantum computing can be a, a good idea. And one of the reasons is, is that uh, in, you know, this paper from, from the 90s uh, by Peter Shore, this sort of ubiquitous paper that, that came out, um, basically said that the encryption techniques that are currently used, which rely on finding the prime number factorization. So given a very large integer, you can find um, a string of prime numbers such that when they're multiplied up, they reproduce the integer. And so solving that problem in the forward direction, where I take the prime numbers and I recover the integer is very, very easy. Your computer can do this. Um, however, when your computer receives the integer, um, doing the inverse problem is very, very difficult. We don't have a good classical algorithm that can accomplish this. This is a, a big question in math, um, how to do this and how to understand prime numbers uh, in a way that would allow us to solve this problem. But on a quantum computer, at least, we have an algorithm that allows you to do this um, prime number, recover this prime number factorization of an integer. And um, so this is one of the big examples. I think that this is the big example largely because you know there's national security implications for everybody if you can break everyone's encryption I mean, this is obviously a um, something that is bad so studying a quantum computer is useful at least at that level um, but it gets a lot of money because uh, that's a kind of a scary consequence of quantum computing um, i'll also point out that there's some other algorithms like a, a grover search algorithm which says that you can search on a list of uh, uh, n objects in square root of n time, which is kind of a fun consequence of using things in superposition. And then there's others such as gradients, which I'll talk about later in the talk. And then there's also a, a completely worthless algorithm called the Deutsch-Yosa algorithm. And basically this is a, it's a useless algorithm, so I'm not gonna say much about it, but I'll just say it has a proven quantum speed up over classical methods. Um, so I thought that as a good example of how to design and construct a quantum algorithm, or a good, you know, a good real-world example of how to sort of focus in on what is important inside of a quantum algorithm. Um, I would, I would just go step by step through how to do a, a quantum Fourier transform. Um, so the particular example that I'm going to give has some swap operations that appear at the end, and it turns out that this version, the original version, is. Uh, order n squared, which is pretty good because the classical algorithm is order two to the n. Um, but there is a version that can scale as n log n. So the quantum Fourier transform is going to be a big speed up over classical um, methods. The, the only thing is, is that uh, you know, if you're keen and you're, you're looking through this argument, um, in order to actually discover all of the coefficients that I'm going to generate from this procedure, that would cost an exponential amount of time to do. So that you can solve for all of them much faster than you could classically, but you uh, um, don't wind up getting as much information other than maybe, you know, uh, 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 everything is in a superposition. So it's very, very hard to extract all the information out. Um, okay, so the, the, the formulation of the problem is, is that I want to take some integer representation here, which is represented as y, I want to apply this kernel, which looks exactly like I would apply a Fourier transform kernel. And if you're having trouble seeing it, then it looks like i to the kx, if you like. Um, and, and what I want to wind up is the Fourier transform version of the integer y as some other integer x. So the question is, how do we represent this on a quantum computer, which only has, um, you can basically think about it as a spin half particle for a qubit that can exist in some superposition of zeros and ones. And the idea that we want to do is we want to um, recover some binary representation of this integer y. So this is what's being shown here. And all of these y sub whatever terms that are zero index, all of these y sub zero terms are um, uh, either zero or one. So it's either, it's, it's, it's effectively just the binary representation of, of the integer. Maybe I don't need to walk everyone through that. Um, and so the idea is, is that whenever I write this, this register of, of qubits y, then I can take it and I can say, well, 
the first qubit is either 0 or 1, the second qubit is 0 or 1, the third qubit is 0 or 1, and this is some tensor product of all of these states. So what I want to do is I want to return back to this, this kernel transformation, and what I want to do is I want to impose that binary representation. So I'm going to take y and I'm going to expand it in terms of something that looks like a, you know, a 0 or 1 is sitting on all of these um, uh, 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 qubit states here. Now, if I expand out this expression into uh, this familiar zeros and ones, I find that I could only I could write a phase factor. Uh, so, so keep in mind that the y sub l is either zero or one. So here you get a one, and here you get some. You know, you here you, it's just substituting in the, the the factor one. So this this is starting to look like something that I might be able to design a quantum algorithm around. Um, the zero state here uh, is going to have is is going to appear, and then there's also a, a one state. That appears here. So this uh, phase factor is going to have to only appear on the one state. That's sort of the second operation that I'm going to need to generate. And the first operation is the generating this linear superposition of zero and one states. So those are really the two operations that we're going to need to make gates in order to actually establish a, a quantum Fourier transform. So just mathematically, there are the two gates that I need to apply. Um, one is called a Hadamard transformation. And this basically generates um, equal superpositions of states on an individual qubit. So if I start off with a zero state on a qubit and I apply this Hadamard transformation, you can just kind of guess based on the, the fact that it's unitary and the fact that you need to generate equal superpositions, then you get this equal superposition. Aha, okay, so task one solved. I need to apply a Hadamard transformation. Task two though is, Based on, after I've applied this Hadamard transformation onto the qubit state, I then need to generate this phase factor. And so the second gate that I need to introduce here looks like this. It's this R gate that introduces this, this phase factor here. Okay, so we've done our job. What we've done is we've been able to make a um, set of two gates that can reproduce the quantum Fourier transform that we have previously. So then if we take a look at the diagram of what this looks like, um, is each time we're going to generate a Hadamard transformation, and then we're going to apply a um, one of these phase gates onto um, uh, onto uh, uh, this um, onto the onto the register afterward, and and basically there's there's sort of one less gate as you go along the entire time, and then eventually you generate this equal superposition of, of states. And if you think, if you write this down carefully, then you can see that this recovers the quantum Fourier transform, so, uh, which is given here. So this is just sort of a, an, you know, a very, very basic example of some way that you might use the, the um, quantum computer to generate something much faster than you could on a classical computer. Um, the quantum Fourier transform, it turns out, is used as a subroutine in some other Algorithm. So, like I said, if you wanted to measure these coefficients and actually get all of the information out of this, this would be uh, a challenge. You'd have to do this, and you'd have to do this entire procedure an exponential amount of times. And um, the idea is that uh, you you don't sort of want to do that. That would destroy your your quantum advantage. But this algorithm can be useful as as a means to generate some some states or some data on the quantum computer and then use it in another context. And, and uh, we might have time to see an example of that. Um, well, actually, okay, so we'll see it on this slide. So there are other algorithms that can be applied that um, generate the, uh, um, the eigenvalue of a given wave function. So, you know, as a, just a simply mathematical example, if I wanna take a wave function and if I know that generating all of the, uh, um, coefficients and all of the numbers that are involved in this wave function is can be very expensive, although um, there are recent results that say that it's less expensive than we thought. Um, there is a way to generate the, um, the eigenvalue uh, psi here. And so this is the circuit. I'm not going to go through it, but I'm just going to say that we can use the inverse of the quantum Fourier transform that we just went over. And um, we can then generate the, the eigenvalue on the quantum computer. Um, so this is this is actually a very nice um, way to to think about things. Is there are sort of alternative procedures that I can use, and alternative um, ways that I can use the quantum computer in order to generate things that I might think I could generate automatically on the classical computer, uh, but on the quantum computer I need to play by different rules, and, and this is an efficient way to get the the uh, um, uh, the eigenvalue without doing some full tomography of the wave function. 
Okay, so um, as promised earlier, I, I was going to show an example of a of a true quantum speed up here, and um, one of those quantum speed ups is generating gradients. Uh, so unlike classical uh, techniques to do this, where you're you're forced to write some finite difference uh, version of the derivative and then evaluate d plus one grid points, on the classical computer you only need to evaluate this algorithm once in order to generate the gradient at every hit one of the grid points. So this is quite a quite a novel uh, fact of the quantum computer. The um, uh, the uh, um, there's a series of Hadamard gates. There's our friend the quantum Fourier transform. There's some function that we apply onto all of the equal superpositions. And then when we add these together, there's a nice there's a trick called a phase kickback, which essentially allows us to then um, ha having having generated an equal superposition of all possible states on a quantum computer, that's essentially accounting for all of the possible variations of the gradient. And so then when we perform the inverse Fourier, the quantum Fourier, the inverse quantum Fourier transform, if we have sort of kept some of the, the numbers very small, then this turns exactly into the gradient and then we're able to measure that. So this is quite a quite a nice consequence of, of uh, uh, quantum computing um, that, uh, that exists already out there. Um, I'm going to skip over Grover's search, uh, even though it's kind of important for what we're going to talk about next. But, um, you know, of course, you know that searching through a, a vector of n on average costs order n operations. You need to check each one of them or maybe half of all of them on average. But um, we don't care about the half of complexity estimates. Uh, it turns out that on in quantum physics, that if you look at an equal superposition and you want to identify one of these states, like the one zero state, then it only costs order n squared um, queries to this uh, 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 state in order to, to increase the amplitude to a, a sufficient amount to, to measure it. Um, so that's just another fun consequence of things. Um, uh, I think I, I decided to sort of peek ahead, but there's a particular version of Grover's search that allows you to essentially apply operators onto wave functions um, and guarantee that the, 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 the correct result is um, uh, 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 obtained. But I'm just going to refer the details to Robin Kothari's thesis, or if you want to ask me questions, then I can sort of um, uh, uh, do this. But it's a search over some auxiliary qubits that you use in order to write the, the operator. Um, and uh, I'll just I'll put that in our back pockets for later because that'll be a, an algorithm that we'll want to look at. So uh, maybe for this audience, going over quantum chemistry is not so useful, but I'll, I'll just I'll give the absolute briefest of introductions to it. So whenever you're trying to solve a, a, a many-body problem with quantum physics, then what you want to do is you want to solve the many-body problem so we know what the Hamiltonian looks like. And the idea is, is that you need to pick a basis set for some external potential. You need to write the many-body Hamiltonian uh, and I'm choosing to write this as a second quantized version here, which I think is the, the going strategy for everyone in attendance. Um, and then you need to find some sort of solver. Uh, and all the solvers that we have on the classical computer are either too expensive to use uh, exactly, like full CI, uh, that would be too expensive to do, exact diagonalization, full CI, same thing. Um, and Or we have to approximate that solver, and that introduces some, some uh, inaccuracies into the results. So there's this decades long quest to improve these methods and to characterize these methods. And despite all these inaccuracies, we've been able to make a lot of successes and a lot of discoveries based on these. But what the quantum computer is trying to do is once you do these first two steps, it's trying to solve the problem without any approximations. That's sort of the promise that is going on here. Um, so despite that promise, it's still hard to simulate efficiently. Uh, even for the quantum computer. So uh, the complexity class that these problems reside in is something called QMA hard. And uh, that basically means it's not going to be, you're not going to have some super efficient method that costs polynomial time for both quantum or for either quantum or classical computers. That's essentially what that statement says. Um, you know, you, you're, you should expect that for every possible system that you would want to solve, that it would take a long time. Um, but nevertheless, if we want to solve these things and we want to improve technologies, then we need to find a good method. We need to find a good solver. And um, even as far back as 2010, there were demonstrations that a quantum computer could solve these um, uh, quantum chemistry Hamiltonians. And um, the, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you're unimpressed by these results. Uh, these were a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't think I have the 
the, the, the year here, but uh, you can see that these black dots, which are the results from the quantum computer are not even close to chemical accuracy. You can see that, um, you know, these, uh, the bonding region isn't being captured very well. And that's because they're using very, very minimal basis sets like four or six sites for kind of a big uh, molecule. And, you know, of course it just gets worse as you, as you do more, uh, uh, things. And then you can also pick apart that they're only solving planar molecules. I know that they've done water molecules too. Um, the, uh, um, you know, there's a lot to sort of pick apart here from a, a quantum chemistry perspective. And, and there are improved results in the literature, but um, these aren't something that you would immediately start using your quantum computer to solve. You can solve these problems in way less time than can be solved on a quantum computer right now. You know, you can solve this this thing probably with I don't know, 16 basis functions in less than an hour uh, on a classical computer and but really the, the the thing that is probably holding back quantum computing in the long run you know as quantum computing gets better and better we should be able to improve these results it's really that this costs many many measurements so classical computers have an immediate advantage here once you generate the coefficients of the wave function ansatz, you can use that to obtain just about all of the information that you want from the problem and you don't need to rerun the solver over and over and over again so this is something that I think my colleague and I at Sherbrooke were decided that this was the thing to focus in on is, is that repeated wave function preparation is really a, a killer here in terms of the time that it takes to generate one of these data points. So one of the original, so let's talk about how you generate wave functions on a quantum computer because so far we haven't, we haven't talked about that. And I have only an underwhelming algorithm to present to you, which was the original algorithm that people decided to use on the, on the quantum computer, which is real-time evolution. Now, real-time evolution is, is familiar to you if you studied um, quantum field theories. This is how you use it to set up. You start with some non-interacting Hamiltonian, then you slowly turn on the interaction, and then at some final time, uh, you obtain the, the, the correct ground state. Same idea here. If you prepare an initial non-interacting wave function or something like Hart the Hartree-Fock wave, wave function, you know that there's some missing part of your Hamiltonian. And so from the bare Hamiltonian that you start, which is H0 here, you start including that electron-electron term more and more. And if you do this slowly enough, by taking some Toronto Suzuki decomposition of your time evolution operator, if you do this slowly enough, then the initial wave function will morph into the final wave function. Now, um, there's nothing stopping you from doing this on a classical computer. You could, if you wanted to, which I don't recommend, go and implement this. But it's very, very time consuming. So the reason that this is popular in quantum computing circles is that quantum computing is coming from uh, 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 computer science where they care about computational complexity. And the original paper that looked at this said, well, in the asymptotic limit of a local basis set, the electron electron or the, you know, the if I pick the right basis set, it looks like a density matrix here. So that looks like an order n squared operation. Aha, the number of operations that I need to apply here asymptotically is only order n squared. And so they said, wow, it's polynomial scale, polynomially scaling. Um, that's you know much better than than exponentially scaling. The thing is, is that they forgot the prefactor, which isn't included in computational uh, complexity estimates. The time step that you need here in order to make this work is is arbitrarily small. And so in 2014, uh, my colleague David Poulan, um, in, a, in a paper that really shook the, the quantum computing community, said the amount of time that it takes to run a 36 electron system is two to three months for one wave function preparation using this technique. And so what you do at the end of the two to three months is you measure it, and then you go right back to calculating it again because that single measurement doesn't give you enough information to reconstruct the, the expectation value. And then you only get one expectation value. So this is a, this is a decades or centuries long um, project that you'd be sending someone to do. Uh, clearly it's not sufficient. Um, there, so, Let's talk about maybe some ways to, to make this so that we don't have to perform as many measurements. So I'll come back later and I'll have something of a solution for uh, wave function preparation. But the first thing that we wanted to look at is what are the most efficient quantities that you can ob obtain from the quantum computer? And the answer here is um, uh, basically pure density functional theory. So uh, maybe for this audience, this is old news, but uh, back in 1964, Ho Hohenberg and Cohn 
Um, I don't know why I switched their names here. It's the other way around on the paper. Sorry, sorry, don't tell our advisor. Um, but uh, um, uh, uh, Hollenberg and Cohn made this uh, existence proof. They basically said that you can replace the wave function by the, the, the one body density. And uh, this is a fine thing to do. You don't lose information. You lose phase information, but you, in principle, you can recover it. Um, and the energy is then no, no longer produced by some Hamiltonian acting on the, the one body density. It's produced by a functional, which is a mathematical object that takes a vector and returns a scalar. And if you want to go searching for this functional, it turns out that it's also QMA hard to do. So you'll never do it on a, a classical computer or a quantum computer. And, uh, but nevertheless, if you want to uh, use density functional theory, you know what the potential functional looks like. That's the second term. You, you have the density and you have the external potential. Wonderful, good. The universal functional, however, is not known. So we have no idea what F looks like. The only thing that we know is, is that it's not dependent on the external potential. Um, and so this is, you know, basically the only way to, uh, um, uh, we, we know very limited things about the, the universal functional. Um, although I think maybe some people would disagree with, with the use of the word limited there. Um, so the, the, the point is, is that um, if I can go from measuring the number of group points to the 6n or the 3n three, three here, to the, the number of group points in one dimension to the 3n power, uh, to the 6n power, I'm messing everything up, it's too early. Um, the, the point is, is that there's a lot of information that I need to reconstruct in order to get the wave function. However, if I want to look at the density, there's drastically less information. And if this proof is correct, which it is, then that says that if I obtain the density, then I'm obtaining uh, just as much information as I would from the, the wave function. So it might be good to just find these densities instead of trying to find the full wave function. And the idea here is, um, um, is, is to then not only find the density, but to also find the functional skip the, the longer version of that slide. Um, uh, but then there's also something, there's also another reformulation of the project, which appeared one year later after the Hohenberg and Cohn paper, which basically says that given a density, I can think about it in one of two ways. I can think about it as coming from a non-interacting problem, which is this VS, which is known as the cone champ potential. Or if I add in the electron-electron interaction, I can change the external potential so that it uh, appears as the uh, exact density here. And both of those problems um, give the same density. And on a grid, everything is regularized. So everything that I'm going to talk about here is view representable. So everything is, uh, um, uh, uh, should be able, we should be able to find this equivalent non-interacting system. And that's known as the cone champ potential. So that's the other useful quantity that I might want to pull off of the quantum computer. So um, I had some work in 2016, which um, was attempting to machine learn the pure density functional for, uh, you know, use in other contexts. And we, we, we basically showed that it doesn't cost an exponential number of training points in order to obtain. So this has gone on, this has a life of its own now to uh, finding the, um, uh, uh, demonstrating this on real systems, and there's, there's some nice results there. So you can apply this in three dimensions. And uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to apply as many of these techniques onto the quantum computer as we possibly could. Um, from the perspective of you actually using uh, uh, quantum computing and all of these advancements on the classical computer. Um, so uh, the, the tool that we used is basically, instead of trying to perform all of these measurements, what we want to do instead is we want to perform some sampling of the wave function. So some way to get expectation values off the quantum computer without destroying the wave function. So there is a way to do this. And this was originally introduced for classical metropolis tasting sampling um, on, the, on the classical computer. So the idea is that, uh, um, and I'll just go through this for the, the metropolis example, but starting from initial wave function and the energy, what we can do is we can apply some operation on the wave function. That'll be give us access to the, um, uh, to the, uh, um, the expectation value. And then if we re-measure the energy, it can tell us how to get back to the original wave function. So the way that we do that is um, we have some unknown operator in, in the context of uh, you know, metropolis sampling, then this would just be some spin flip operator. In other words, choosing at random some spin on the lattice and then attempting to flip it. This produces a linear combination of uh, wave functions here. 
So these x's are some probability amplitudes and the, the psi functions, there should be an index k here. Um, uh, what that does is it basically says that in the energy eigenbasis, which is the relevant one here, I've now generated a superposition of states upon applying this operator. And the idea is, is that if I then apply my, my probabilities as I would in any classical metropolis hastings uh, example, I can weight these states against each other. And so what, I, what happens when I do that is I obtain sort of for the good state, the one that I want to recover, that I might want to recover here, or it's the logic is flipped in the metropolis sampling. So um, I, I you know, might want to get the other one so that I just want to evaluate the probabilities here. What I can then do is I can evaluate the energy of this new state K, whatever this is. And uh, what I can then do is I can compare these two. I can convert, I can compare bitwise. In other words, just comparing the states in the qubit and in, in each of the qubits. And if I get that there's a match, or I think, I think this is, I compare these for the, for the metropolis sampling, I compare these in such a way such that if it's a, um, ex reject the spin flip, then it's a one. And if I accept the spin flip, then it's a zero. And I think I have that right. It, may, it might be flipped around. Um, ah, good. Ha, yes, uh, I was flipped around. So this is the accept and this is the reject. And so then what I do is I measure only the last qubit. And I contend that there's some experimental way to do this because on paper, I can write down the partial trace over that qubit. And essentially what this does is it only lightly disturbs the wave function here. So the wave function is basically unchanged when I just measure one of the qubits. There is no formal accepted theory of measurement, but, but uh, I, when I do this and perform the partial trace, then, then that's what happens. So um, if I get, the, I get the original wave function back, I'm good, things are fine. And I just continue on with the, op the operation. And the ratio of the number of acceptances to the number of times that I run this algorithm is the expectation value. Now, there's also a recovery procedure, which I'm gonna skip. Um, but basically what it does is it recovers the wave function if you wound up with the uh, wrong, you know, if you wanted to reject that step and then there's a way to get back to the original wave function, just basically by undoing and redoing the operations that you've done up to this point until you obtain the original wave function. And there's a statistical um, argument about how many times this should take to recover the wave function. And you can think about it like a half-life. It eventually will recover the wave function in, in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so what we do is we have, and that's what this is. So we have a, a feasible way to obtain information from the quantum computer without fully measuring the wave function. So, <clears throat> Let's give a very minimal example of how we might use this. So we might spend two to three months making real-time evolution, but then we want to keep this wave function around because we don't want to spend another two to three months doing this. And so we've taken some external potential. We've obtained some wave function here, and then we use our quantum phase estimation to get the energy. And what you would normally do at this point is you would measure and then redo, but that's not so good. Instead, what we can do is we can use this quantum counting, our quantum amplitude estimation, um, I'll call it quantum counting, even though there's a name to generacy. We can talk about that if you're curious. Um, to sample from the energy in order to get some relevant quantity of interest. And so that's what I'm going to do. Is that anytime I've obtained an operator and a wave function, I can obtain the expectation value through this. So the rest of, for the rest of the talk, we're just basically going to look for operators and wave functions and try and put them together in such a way that we get um, the correct uh, answer. Now, uh, the full circuit in order to recover ground state density functional theory with this method would look like this. So this is the this is this was on the previous slide: real time evolution to get the wave function, quantum phase estimation to get the energy, and then we can use quantum counting or quantum amplitude. Qu QC is has a big degeneracy here. It's quantum counting. It's quantum chemistry. It's quantum computing. So we use the other name, quantum amplitude estimation, in order to get the coefficients of the density matrix. Now you could perform some machine learning, like a literal implementation of stochastic gradient descent on the quantum computer, um, but this is sort of an optional step uh, that, that we included just in case someone actually wanted to use this. So um, I'm gonna skip this, but there are good reasons to think that quantum machine learning is not going to um, bear fruit. However, if you're looking to uh, um, get a more accurate quantum machine learning method, then, then there, are, there is recent evidence that you can do this. Uh, for kernel-based uh, fun uh, functionals functions, but maybe we should maybe we should just skip on to the things that really matter. And basically, the idea is is that since I've identified this operator, which is the the density matrix acting on some 
wave function, then uh, uh, I can obtain all of the quantities of the density matrix that only costs order n squared, or if you use a local basis, order n, but that means that your n is probably much, much larger. Um, so we'll just stick with the order n squared for the, um, the, the, the non-orthogonal basis sets. And basically, quantum counting says that we can take this operator and obtain what we want. So this is very good news. We can get all of ground state density functional theory. Now you might be asking, as our advisor would, how do you get the cone shift? But what about the cone shift potential? How would you obtain that from the quantum computer? And if we go back to um, this uh, uh, um, uh, quantum gradient method, this is basically something that's going to save us here. So uh, um, some work from Tim actually inspired uh, looking at this as the cost function for the cone champ potential. So the cone champ potential is contained in this term here. And if we evaluate the exact wave function on this, on the cone champ Hamiltonian versus evaluating the cone champ wave function on the cone champ Hamiltonian, then if you minimize this, then you obtain the cone champ potential uh, for this. So this acts like a minimization principle for this. And since I'm allowed to evaluate basically arbitrary functions very, very easily in terms of a gradient, like this would be a, an awful expression to do on a classical computer. But on the quantum computer, there's order one oracle queries here. So all I need to do is use my quantum counting to apply this Hamiltonian operator onto psi and then get the energy basically of the, the non-interacting system, which is very, very easy. Um, then I can start with my n coefficients for some cone champ potential, like some guess, maybe from LDA. Then I can use my quantum counting to generate the Oracle uh, uh, information here. I can apply that quantum gradient algorithm that I, that I showed earlier. And then if I take the gradients that result from that and add it to the original, um, uh, uh, add it to the original uh, coefficients, then I can just repeat this process until I've converged to the current ground state. So this is really enabled by these quantum speedups on evaluating these terms here. Uh, so actually, thank you, Tim, for that visit and that, that five hours of your your advisor's time at the time, because that, that told me how to do this. Um, uh, so thank you, Nikitas. Uh, good apples. Um, uh, okay, so all right, so we've arrived. We have all of these expectation values that are coming out of the quantum computer. We're not destroying the wave function. We're not taking two to three months to do it. Now we're going to sort of close the loop. We're going to get a quantity that you cannot get uh, efficiently on a classical computer. And we're also then going to propose a way to get wave functions so that we can actually do all of this. So the next project that I decided to do um, was obtaining Green's functions from the quantum computer. And there were some other proposals to do this that were using real-time evolutions and calculating for a single frequency. But if you know anything about the continued fraction representation of the Green's function, you know that these alpha and beta coefficients, if you know them, then you know what the Green's function looks like at all frequencies, assuming you can take this expectation value up here, which we know we can do based on the quantum counting argument. So what are these alpha and beta coefficients? Well, they are the Langshaus alpha and beta coefficients that are here. And so the idea behind Langshaus is to say that the entire Hilbert space can be shrunk down to a tridiagonal matrix, and then that can be used. Um, so if you, if you know about anything about a power method, this is basically saying that the, the number of terms that you need to keep uh, are basically limited to three. And so if you apply this Langshaus recursion uh, method on this crowd of, on these crowd of subspace vectors, it's a recursive relation. And uh, once you construct the alpha and the beta coefficients for each of the steps in the Langshaus recursion, you can recover this tridiagonal matrix. And this is a this is a wonderful statement because it means that you're able to effectively solve the problem. And there are some issues with applying this on the classical computer. The reason that we don't use this on the classical computer is numerical precision kills you. These beta coefficients, um, because of double precision, they don't they don't retain their accuracy. And so you can solve for maybe 10 to 12 levels at double precision. And if you go up to quadruple precision, I don't think you get too many more. Um, but so numerical accuracy really kills you on the classical computer. The second, the second issue is, is that even though this is only a tridiagonal matrix, the, the size of the wave function that you need to store is exponentially sized. So this means that basically classical computers can only use this on very small systems. So on a quantum computer, however, we don't have these memory restrictions. The qubits can hold essentially down to the uncertainty principle. We also don't have double precision uh, for that, basically the same reason. So why not, since we're applying operators onto wave functions throughout this whole talk, and, and since uh, this is such a valuable quantity, 
why don't we use Langshaw's recursion and try and get these alpha and beta coefficients from the quantum computer? So um, alpha looks like this. So we have an operator. We've got a wave function. Good. We can use uh, quantum counting in order to obtain the expectation value here. Then uh, for the beta coefficients, you can also can, you can also identify an operator and a wave function, and then there's a different wave function here. So the reverse operation that you need to do is is a little bit different, but good. We can obtain the beta coefficients through the same exactly the same procedure, which means we can use the same um, uh, uh, wave function for obtaining all of the Langshaw's coefficients. Um, now, if you're sort of worried, there's a a technical thing that technically all of those the uh, applying the full Hamiltonian onto the wave function is exponential time, but uh, you can break up the the the, uh, the Hamiltonian into, into smaller pieces and apply it more incrementally, and so that's basically what these plots are showing. So for if I just take one uh, interaction term and I apply it incrementally, then with two or four Langshaw's steps, then I can obtain. The, the ground state energy down to a very reasonable accuracy. Uh, same thing if I've got a big perturbation here required four length of steps or take or sort of putting a, a half term and then applying that term twice um, to do this. And then just for fun, I showed what happened if you start with a random psi and again, it converges very, very quickly. And that's sort of the story of length is this, this, that this is a rapidly convergent method and it's exact. So um, uh, the idea, is that you can use that and then you can obtain the Green's function, which is highly, highly valuable and very, very difficult to obtain otherwise. Now, um, after I submitted an in-between one of the referee reports, I realized that Langshaw's methods could also be used to obtain the ground state. And the idea is, is that um, you use this three-term recursion relation, you generate your Hamiltonian here, and upon diagonalization, uh, sorry, this is the this is the form, this is converting from the original wave function that I put in. Through some G operator to a, an element of the Krylov subspace, which sort of informs how I write those operators down to using quantum counting. Um, but if I obtain these coefficients gamma and I apply them on these G operators and I apply that onto the original wave function as this operator Y, then I obtain the, oops, I guess I don't have the, the expression written. Mm -hmm. But if I were to just apply the Y operator onto the original ground state wave function, then I obtain, uh, on, then I obtain the new ground state wave function which can be made to be uh, accurate out to uh, the precision required by quantum phase estimation. Now, there are some other questions that you can ask, like if I have some uncertainty in my Langshaw's operations, then how does that scale? And the answer is linearly. Um, uh, you can also recover excited states. So that's in this paper that I just put on the archive. And basically for these excited states, you can extend the scalar Langshaw's equations to a block Langshaw's method, um, which is also suitable on a classical computer, but essentially this block Langshaw's method uh, allows you to resolve degeneracies very, very well. Uh, and with the good error, error scaling and, and lacking any loss of precision, then this is a very, very good um, result to obtain here. Um, now, just as a, um, uh, a um, sort of a, a coda on all of these arguments, because this is the, the second to last slide, um, if you wanted to actually do tomography on these states, um, it, it was proven in this paper that it's dependent on the logarithm of the Hilbert space size, which is actually a pretty stunning result. So um, you, you don't need to investigate sort of the whole exponentially sized Hilbert space. You can get away with performing vastly fewer measurements. The only thing is, is that in this paper and then in, 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 in this popular implementation of these ideas, um, it uh, still requires that you start from some initial wave function. So if you sort of pay attention to the, the flow of the arguments here, at the very beginning of this talk, I said the existing methods to generate wave functions on, on quantum computers are not particularly compelling for large systems. They, they, they don't really hold up uh, to what we're doing. Um, however, uh, at the end of this talk, what we have is we have this very nice method with these Langshaw space methods to generate ground state wave functions. And this ground state wave function, once you know the coefficients, you can just repeat that process over and over and over again. So I think, I think one of the next questions to answer is, how efficient can that be in order to um, maybe interface with these methods and then to show that uh, um, there is an efficient way to generate these wave functions and that you can then use these methods to do the full tomography on the wave function. Or you can use these quantum counting techniques, which 
scale a little bit better in terms of the precision here. And it could be that the quantum counting techniques um, sort of eclipse the, the computational complexity of these methods. I think that these are the open questions that, that I'm going to head towards next, but, um, or, the, or if someone in the community wants to as well. Um, okay, so uh, there was obviously a lot here. We did a bit of an introduction to quantum computing techniques. Um, and the idea, the, the, the main focus of this talk was how do we sort of recycle the wave functions so that we, we don't have to perform a lot of um, uh, steps in order to uh, uh, make wave functions and, and to get quantities that we might want to get otherwise. And one of those was to look at density functional theory and how to implement that efficiently on the quantum computer and essentially interfacing that with the quantum counting methods was very, very powerful. Um, you could then machine learn the, the answer or use these shadow tomography techniques to obtain a kernel representation that uh, is particularly accurate. Um, there's a method then to get Conchamp potentials that's particularly efficient. Uh, but then as sort of, I think the, the main results here is, is that you can get the full continued fraction representation off the quantum computer and use this to, to perform the, the Green's function. And then the, the future directions, like I said, are going to be the, uh, um, applying the, uh, the wave function techniques in a, in a realistic way to show that they're competitive and compelling. And they can be used uh, in a good way. So thank you for your attention. If you have any uh, uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Don't dive field. It's an interesting take on things. Don't be afraid to, uh, to ask. So yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your talk. Thanks. I mean, the introduction, I think, was very useful. And I mean, the results were very, very interesting, insightful. Yeah. Um, thank you.